Director is, uh, needs no introduction. Uh, Howard Nations, I always say that, but then I go, uh, go ahead and introduce him anyway, but I'm going to. There was one time I actually sat down, and it was funny, but I won't do that now because Howard Nations deserves uh, to be known um, by all the people here and all the people who will be purchasing the videotape. He's been at the forefront at civil and personal injury litigation for 45 years. He's built a national practice focused on mass tort pharmaceuticals, catastrophic injuries, and complex business litigation. Mr. Nations uh, co-founded and is the current co-chair of the National College of Advocacy and has taught advocacy-related courses in law schools for 35 years. He's pioneered the use of forensic, uh, psychological, and neurolinguistic principles to persuade judges and jurors in trial. He served as president of the National Trial Lawyers, the Texas Trial Lawyers, the Southern Trial Lawyers Association, the Melvin Belli Association, and the Lethia Institute. He served five years on AJ's executive committee. He's been in, in, uh, inducted into the Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame in 2012 and is the recipient of awards too numerous to discuss right now. Um, Mr. Nations uh, always brings with him um, practical tips, his insight, his experience, and we're very lucky to have him addressing us today. Please welcome Howard Nations. Good morning. Decision making something we're very involved in. I've always been a strong believer in cross-training. We learn law, we practice law, but there are great influences on decision-making by jurors. There are great influences outside of law that we're not taught. We have to self-teach. We have to have programs like this where we can learn from each other. But I've always been a strong believer in cross-training in the other disciplines other than law. When storytelling became the thing, uh, I went out to Barnes & Noble and I bought literally 12 books. They're like this, the little small books. But I bought 12 books that were written by script writers, by the best script writers uh, in, in the country on how to write a script. Why? What are they doing with script writing? They're telling a story. These are the people, these are books on how do you tell a story. And so when we think about decision making, we are very fortunate that we have some brilliant, very brilliant people outside of our discipline who have spent a lot of time and a lot of extremely strong effort that they've put into their lives that we put into, what, what influences decision making? And when we get to decision making, we're going to talk about some of those people. And I'm going to, uh, I'll give you some information today. I'll give you some recommendations on where you can get far more valuable information than I can give you today. But I'll try to uh, encapsulate uh, uh, some of what I've learned for you, uh, both from practice and from from studying the cross disciplines of psychology and, and sociology. So when we think about decision making, we're thinking about a jury or a juror. How, how do we influence the, that one juror to our way of thinking or that collective jury to our way of thinking? In the realm of de, uh, decision making, we're dealing with two separate things. One is the individual juror, the 12 individuals that are there. So we have individual decision making. That's what takes place first. Each one of those juries is influenced by us to make a decision. Then you have group decision making. When they get together in a room and there are 12 of them and they're working as a group, then you have a whole different dynamic. Everyone has their own point of view. Everyone at that point has their own trial story. But now you've got a different dynamic of decision making. It's group decision making. And then you get to that first vote. You know, seldom, if ever, do you have the first vote of a jury that's 12 and 0. If it is, you should have settled a long time ago. That's some very bad decision making on a lawyer uh, for, uh, for the most part. So you very seldom see a 12 0 verdict. The, usually the first verdict may be 7 5. Six, six. So if you start with a seven, five, 
how do you get from 7-5 to 10-2 or 9-3 or 12-0, whatever it is that you need? It's because you have the third dynamic of group versus group decision making. You got groups trying to persuade each other. So when we look at the panel, when we look at the demographics of our jurors, we have to stop and think in terms of ultimately, you know, we say we give the closing argument. We don't. We give summation. The closing argument, the one that really counts, is the one that takes place in the jury room between those 12 jurors, between those two groups, between this group of seven and this group of five, where this group of seven is trying to move three more over to their side or four more over to their side. That's the final argument. So it's extremely important that we identify the leaders because within any, gr any group of jurors, you're going to have leaders. You're going to have followers who are, okay, whatever. Let's move on out of here. Uh, you're going to have mediators who try to bring the two sides together. Let's just reach a verdict. And you're going to have bench warmers. Now, obviously, your most important people are your leaders. So in the decision-making process, our first task is to identify on our panel who are the prospective leaders and then also to make an educated guess of which way they're going to lead. Are they going to be leading with us? Or are they going to be leading against us? And we go to demographics for that. So our starting point in the decision-making process is a careful study of the written material that we have, the questionnaire, uh, whatever questionnaire you get, uh, whatever information you get uh, in your jurisdiction uh, on the jurors. And we look for, you look for things in the, in the questionnaire. And then, of course, uh, obviously, if you can get a supplemental juror questionnaire, then you can design some very specific questions which help you identify leadership qualities, help you identify the people who are most likely to be your leaders. But we look at leadership in terms of what is this person's position in their everyday life? Is this a person who is a leader at work? Is this a person who is a leader in the community? Is this a person who is accustomed to being followed? Or is this a person who shows no sign of leadership? Is this person a follower? Uh, you'll get uh, people like, uh, I had a panel up in, uh, right outside of Fort Hood where I had, I had a retired colonel and a retired master sergeant. Now they're both years of leadership. And the colonel thinks that, as a, that he's a leader of the, of the military. The master sergeant knows that master sergeants run the military. And so you've got two strong personalities. And there's no question they're going to, they're accustomed to leading, they're going to be leaders in the jury room. So if you let one of them own your panel and they are against you, you're in trouble right off the bat. So you have to be very careful. So when you have to, you look at all the demographics that we have from the questionnaire and try to determine leadership qualities uh, and then which way they're going to lean. And then you have to ask, then that's where your, the, the leanings is where your supplemental juror questionnaire really comes in handy. If you're looking at strong leader, you want to know what the answer to the supplemental juror questionnaire is so that you can get some idea as to which, whether they're going to be with you or whether they're going to be against you. But then you get into specific areas. Somebody may be a leader, may be a strong, they've been a strong leader their entire career, but they're not a leader in this specific area. You may have the, the person who was a, uh, a master sergeant uh, in the military, but it may be a hospital negligence case, and you have another person who is a retired nurse or who is a nurse. Well, her voice is going to ring more loudly and more clearly with the, with the jury. If you, if you let her on your jury, or if you can't keep her off your jury, you don't have enough strikes and you, you're not sure about her, then her specific knowledge 
uh, in the area of medical malpractice, in the area of medicine, in the area of hospital uh, responsibilities and duties is going to is going to carry more weight than just being a leader uh, in the military. So you have to think in terms of the very specific aspects, very specific as aspects of leadership when you're trying to decide on things of this, this nature. Now, once in addition to looking at the um, the demographics that we have, obviously, we have to read. This is where the nonverbal communications really come in very strongly. The ability to read the nonverbal communication of your jury panel and to see how they respond to you. How do they respond to your opponent? Uh, do you have someone who's anxious to, uh, their hands are the first to go up when you, ask, when you ask questions? They're anxious to speak. When they speak, do they speak with authority? When they speak, do they speak in such a way that they're likely to have people follow them uh, at, when they're speaking as a panel member? Um, <clears throat> then you ha it's a good idea at this point to have someone else. This is where you really need somebody else at the table because when we're doing board our examination, we got so many things going on in our mind that it's not just when I'm talking to... Uh, prospective juror Malone and I'm paying a lot of attention to, to Mr. Malone and I'm questioning Mr. Malone and he and I are having an interchange. There are other people on the panel that might be having reactions to what I'm saying but that I don't see. And Tommy may give an answer that's pretty stinging and I want to know how the other 12 people responded to it. So that's why you need to have someone, It's ideally, you have someone who is highly skilled and highly trained at your side who is telling you, hey, this person over here reacted very adversely to you when you were questioning Mr. Malone. So you need somebody to observe. 